welcome back to another episode of Coffee with April. This time, uh, we're going to discuss something very relevant. Uh, we're going to discuss something we're working with at the moment, or at least looking into. What's more important, the country a coffee grows in or the, the terroir? Which, it sounds extremely simple when you say it out loud, because it's obviously the terroir, right? Uh, at least in terms of um, growing coffee or the opportunity that a green coffee has to you know, taste good yeah. from a farming perspective. Obviously, it's more complicated than that as well because you have infrastructure, you have politics, you have currencies, you have logistics, a bunch of other stuff, right? Uh, but the reason why we want to talk about it is that we've recently started to look at a few alternative uh, origins, yeah, let's put sure. it like that, yeah. or origins that people are perhaps not as used to as the kind of classic Ethiopian, Kenyan, Colombian, and so on and so on. Uh, and we see a growing trend and interest in these kind of neighboring for sure. uh, yeah. countries. Yeah. Um, our main reason for looking into them is that we just don't like Brazilian coffee. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Yeah. We're, yeah. Uh, but we're struggling, to yeah. be fair. Like Joe just uh, brought a, was it a, a number five cup of excellence? Yeah. Natural coffee yeah. from this year or last, last year technically. Um, good roast. Solid. 90.4, 90.6, 90.67 yeah. in the competition, yeah. and it still tastes like chocolate nuts. For sure, it's in there, yeah, yeah. yeah. In the, I mean, at the same time, we're we're picking up some Peruvian micro lots, for example, with mm. a lot of complexity, some really interesting things. Uh, we've just sent out a Congolese uh, coffee, for example. Um, really interesting area, uh, Lake Kivu. Yep. Um, and we were super, super surprised by just the complexity of it. Um, and also, I mean, some of the similarities to coffees we've worked with in the same area, but not the same country necessarily. Yeah, sure. um, so it sparks a kind of uh, inquisitive nature that you really want to dive into and just see what the possibilities are. Sure. And the, the question, the real question here is, you know, where is the potential? Where do we find the best tasting coffee yeah. in the future? And that obviously starts with with uh, growing conditions, right? Yeah. So you need to have a, a you know good growing conditions to be able to push coffee that you uh, believe is tasty, and that's basically um, a relatively high altitude, uh, good soil, a like good ecosystem around the, the coffee or the plant farm in itself. Uh, but the interesting thing here is that if we're looking at Congo, for example, it's crazy close to both Rwanda and Burundi. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It shares basically the same terroir. Uh, actually produces some coffee on even higher altitudes than both of those countries. Yeah. Um, it's the same with, with Uganda, for example, and I know we talked about this before, but let's mention it again. Whereas one of the most famous coffees from Uganda these days, yeah, uh, sure. a coffee that Ruben Gardelli roasted uh, for the last world championship and did very, very well. That coffee grows about 500 meters away from a Kenyan coffee, Capsicizio, that we also competed with and then won the Swedish with, right? Yeah. But, you know, it's distinctive in its own right. As oh, well. for sure. Yeah, Definitely. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're, they're very different coffees, but we talk about it as Ugandan coffee that's so different, it's so rare, mm -hmm. but it's actually just 500 meters away from this Kenyan coffee yeah. that is also then just a Kenyan coffee, right? So the interesting thing here is are we looking too much at and which country it is mm -hmm. and too little at, you know, where is that country actually? Located. Yeah. Right. I mean, the questions are there are so many other variables behind the name of an origin that we don't necessarily see. Mm. Um, maybe we can find out, but again, how do we, how do we translate this? How do we explore it? Um, cooperatives can be set up incredibly differently. Uh, yeah, sure. Whether or not that's the way that they're transporting, the size of the cooperatives, the way that they process, is it with multiple factories, is it a single centralized source? All of these must have a effect in the quality of the coffee. Sure, of course. As well as also your sorting and your variables in terms of um, genetics as well. Mm. Um, so the, the Congolese coffee that we spoke about, um, predominantly Babon, but also local derivatives. Yep. What exactly is that? You know, how much of that can we explore? Um, we're then also looking at, for example, I cupped some coffees from uh, El Salvador uh, in Seattle and you'll find an SL28 on the table. Yeah, sure. 
would I have guessed that that was an El Salvadorian coffee off the bat? No, the acidity structure was incredibly mm. interesting, very vibrant, completely different body to the yeah. cup. And it's the genetic in this which is making the difference. Sure. And then the, that's obviously a trend as well, right? Upon this kind of new origins, also simply new varietals in new origins. Yeah. Right? So we're, we're basically identifying a few varietals, SL28, one of them for sure, mm. yeah. Typica, Geisha, and so on, that we all kind of love as. Um, so 34 is starting to happen sure, now yeah. as well and, and we kind of plant them in different places and then see what kind of comes out of it and they still seem to be sharing some of the kind of you know varietal tastes yeah structure, of course if you can say yeah. that right yeah uh, but the the main point we want to kind of uh, discuss here moving forward is that we need to kind of embrace these new origins right so as, as joe said we work with this coffee from congo it has some amazing qualities it also had a few qualities that maybe we don't want in our coffees, yeah. right? Yeah. But from what we could taste there, it's very clear that the potential is there. Yeah. And the biggest challenge with that coffee is the sorting of the coffee, right? Yeah. So it comes from um, a group of farmers that is basically uh, grow coffee over a very big uh, range of altitudes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. from 1400 up to 2400, yeah. right? So obviously it's a mix of a lot of different things. So the question here is, how tasty would the coffee be if we single out only the top growing lots, sure, for yeah. example, right? Yeah. Um, but unless we start investing in these kind of coffees and working with these kind of coffees, we will never find out. For sure, yeah. Because in the end of the day, money is what will drive this kind of process forward. Yeah. Um, and we are interested in it for a lot of different reasons. First of all, because we want to have really tasty coffee. Yeah. Uh, second of all, because that Congo coffee was an organic certified coffee. Maybe the best organic certified coffee I ever had which is very interesting, right? Yeah. Um, which we've also seen from our, our Peruvian micro as yeah, well, which I mean, are all sort of capable organic, of it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but interestingly enough as well, is seasonality, right? So we want to work more with seasonality, um, even to some extent it jeopardizing uh, twist, taste quality overall, because working with fresh coffees is important and i feel that that's something we sometimes are, are missing in coffee more yeah. and more and it's very you know let's be fair ethiopian coffees Kenyan coffees they're still going to taste better than most origins all the year round regardless of how old they are right that's that's probably true but that's also because we put a lot of focus into these yeah. coffees right both in how we buy how we process yeah. down farm level everything yeah. right because we all know they are amazing for sure we have to consider the maturity of the the infrastructure behind some of these origins sure. and, and these individual factories or, or regions that are very well known and popular they're, they're much more developed um, of course there's there's soil biology there's uh, there are key factors to the quality in these coffees as well but I mean we're just curious it's it's exciting to to learn more about what is imparting the biggest impacts on the coffee sure and for example, can we work with a copy continuously over years and actually help to improve that and bring it up in its own uh, kind of unique identity, in mm, a sense. Mm. Um, but still sharing the pedigree of quality that you could expect from a very uh, well-established origin or, or washing mm. station. Yeah. yeah, sure. So we're gonna we're gonna try to do do what we can do, being a tiny company, and then see if we can start supporting these kind of origins in 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 a way that kind of works and functions for us. Uh, we are launching a Tanzanian coffee. Yeah. When you guys watch this, we probably already launched it. Too Most fair. likely. Most likely. And uh, it's, it's a really cool one. Um, definitely a different range of flavor spectrum, but all delicious on the positive side. So like very berry, very juicy, very acidity driven coffee, which uh, which we really like here. Uh, so we're going to see a lot more of that in the future. Um, looking forward to next season in both Bolivia and Peru uh, to see what we can find there. We tried a really good... Uh, uh, Bolivian coffee from Monogram, is that the word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in Canada that we got with this. Uh, that was actually really cool. Yeah, so we've been trying a lot of good coffees from, from these kind of origins. And yeah. we're looking forward to explore that. And if you guys want to explore that as well, then, you know, pop into our website. Membership club is definitely a place where you're going to see a lot mm, of these coffees. Yeah, it's a good space for experimentation. Always a good space. Yeah. So sign up. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys for watching. That was all for, for this time. <laughs>